technical situations because there are too many mics in the world. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the trait system and like how it intersects with the type system. Um, I kind of assume you know a little bit of Rust. Um, we aren't going to cover the, the very basics, but if anything is confusing, please interrupt me and ask questions. Um, raising hands is good. Um, so first, I want to talk about why Rust's type system is worth knowing. Um, the type system is basically the skeleton of the language. It underlies um, some of the most important features. It's how we get our type safety, our memory safety. Um, it also does error handling and flow control. Um, all the operators are implemented with the type system and the trait system. Um, and all of the memory management is done with traits. So this is a very important part of the language to understand. Um, so a brief overview of Rust types. Um, everything in Rust has a type, even if it doesn't look like it does. So this program here, um, there are no types uh, expressly written. And that's because Rust will automatically detect many types um, within a function. So the same function with um, its variables annotated with their types looks like this. Um, and it's like this is what the compiler would have figured out. Well, I don't know that it would have given count an, as an I32, but um, sometimes we need to tell the compiler what we're talking about. Um, the built-in types for like the come with the language, there's this is an incomplete list. Um, there's your basic true false characters are a 30, I think they're a 32 bit value that represents um, a Unicode code point. Um, there's the numeric types, which we'll cover in a second. Uh, arrays and slices and tuples, which all kind of look the same, but are all subtly different. We aren't really going to get into the differences of those because they're subtle and very complicated. <laughs> um, and then string and uh, string reference are sort of like array and slices. Um, the numeric types, there's quite a few of them. And this is um, kind of how they are related. They're various different integer sizes, both signed and unsized, unsigned, and a few floating point numbers types. Uh, the one interesting one here is the I size and U size. Those are the machine type, which means on a 32-bit system, they are 32 bit bits wide. On a 64-bit system, they're 64 bit wide. This is also the size of pointers and like array references. So to talk about traits and types, we kind of need a little bit of code that we can work with throughout the example. So this is something very simple. It takes two numbers, it doubles the first one, adds it to the second, and returns it. Um, that is, wait, sorry, this is an older version. Uh, sorry, this adds two numbers together. Um, well, uh, oh, my slides are out of sync. One second. What I'm seeing on my screen is different. <laughs> so let me uh, fix that real quick. Okay, now we're back in sync. Cool. Um, so, you're right. It doubles the first argument, adds it to the second, and returns it. Um, I, I want to point out the lack of a return keyword here. If you leave off the semicolon on the last expression in the statement, it returns it. And there's a small example of how it's used. Um, so what if we want to do something with this besides integers? If we want to add floats together, and it doesn't work. Um, so this is the compiler telling you that you've messed up your types. Um, it says, I expected an I32 and I found underscore. Underscore is what the Rust compiler uses to mean it's some type, but I'm not exactly sure which one. It knows some things about it, and it knows that it's supposed to be a floating point variable, but it doesn't know if it's an F32 or an F64, or I think that's all it could be. I could be wrong. Um, so Rust has the ability to make functions like this. You just have to be a little cleverer. Um, we can use what's called generics. Now, with a generic, you say, I have it. Sorry, this is another out of sync slide. <laughs> um, I have a function called add, which is generic over the type t. Uh, I want to take two parameters, a, which is a t, 
and b, which is a t. I'm going to return something of the same type, and then add them together. This doesn't work, as you can see. Um, and the reason this doesn't work is because t's can't do anything. They have no methods, they have no operations. They specifically don't have the add operation. If you look at, at this error message, it says the uh, add operator cannot be applied to the type t. And there's a helpful message that says maybe you want to implement the add trait. Um, so let's talk about traits concretely for a moment. This is a quote from the Rust book. Um, a trait is a language feature that tells the Rust compiler that a functionality a type must provide. Um, so traits are how we constrain types, how we limit it from everything to just some types. Um, in, our, in our example, we need to constrain T to only things that can be added. We do that like this, or sorry, and this is the, the add trait. This is a very simplified version of the add trait in Rust. Um, the actual one's more complex and rather than last time I gave this talk, it was too confusing and we spent too much time on it. Um, so reading this, I'm defining a public trait called add. It has one method named add that takes a uh, copy of self or a, it takes self and owns it and it takes a right hand side and it returns the same type. Um, the real one, every one of these arguments can be a different type, which is where most of the complexity comes from. But we'll work with this for today. So here's the version of our, of our toy function. That's what I get for updating my slides at the last minute. Um, that says, I'm function add. I'm generic over a type T, which is constrained by the trait add. Um, I will take A and B, both of type T, and I will return some type, and that's the complexity of the add trait that I tried to remove from my slides, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so now this works with anything that can be added together, like a float. Um, so this is, so that's like an overview of how, the basics of how traits work with the built-in types, um, and how you can use generics and traits to write generic functions. Um, are there any questions about that before we move on? Yeah. Yeah, so when you're defining a trait, if you say self, that is whichever type is implementing the trait. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you can only use it inside traits, um, but it's really handy for writing generic things. Can you? Yeah. Okay. You can use it inside any implementation block, not only traits. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah, so, or you might have something like if you multiply a float by an integer, you get a float. Um, okay. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is custom types. Uh, we're not limited by the types that are in Rust uh, to begin with. We can make our own. Um, so this is a very simple type. Um, we're going to be using complex numbers. And if you don't understand complex numbers, that's okay. They're just a pair of numbers for now. That's all, all we need to worry about. Um, this is a struct that just holds two I32 numbers. Um, very simple. And then we make a instance of complex numbers called C. Um, are, uh, structs are a very common way to hold multiple pieces of data and attach behavior to them. Um, to attach behavior, we use impl blocks. So if we have that struct from last slide, Oh, wait, sorry, I need to full screen this. I didn't notice that. Okay, so if we have the struct from last slide, we can have an implementation uh, for the complex type. We're gonna define one method called new. New will take two 
I32s named real and imag, and it will return a instance of the struct uh, with those fields filled in. This is a pattern you see quite often in Rust to have a, a method named new, um, and this way you can more easily create types that have complex internal structures. It's also usually a little easier to type, um, like with a keyboard, not with the type system. Um, and, but the new method name is not special. It's only by, like, this is what we do by convention. So we could have other constructors. Um, for example, here is a zero constructor for complex numbers. It takes no parameters, and it returns um, the, like, the zero complex number. Um, there's actually a trait in the, uh, I think it's in the standard library, that, that is zero, but we aren't going to use it today. Okay. So right now, if we were try to try and use our toy function on complex numbers, it wouldn't work. And that's because we haven't defined how to add to complex numbers. The way we can do that is by implementing the trait add. So um, we have our original impulse for complex, um, and then we have another impulse for it. We say, I'm going to implement the trait add for the type complex. And then we define the method that's required by the trait, uh, that, that trait that we saw earlier. Um, we define the method add that takes and another complex number and returns a complex number. So then after we've defined this implementation for complex, we can make two complex numbers and we can give them to our toy function. It doubles the first one and returns the second. And this is actually, like coming from, from some other languages, this is pretty profound. Um, in Python, if you try and add two things together, it might work, it might not, you don't know. In Rust, you will know at compile time whether this will work. In C++, if you have uh, templates, I believe they're called, I'm not a C++ programmer, um, but if you try and add the two things that cannot be added together, you get nasty error messages. You get miles of miles long things that say this doesn't work. In Rust, you get a nice simple error message pointing exactly where you need to look. Um, and unlike, for example, Go, we had to opt in to this behavior. We had to say, I can be added. This way you don't have an add method on vectors that adds something to the, uh, like to the vector that accidentally uh, applies to the plus operator. This gives us a really good mix between control of what we want to do without accidentally doing more. Just like how we aren't um, restrained to built-in types, we're also not restrained to the built-in traits. So we can d define our own traits. There's a trait called shape. Shape, uh, we define a shape as something that has an area. Um, and that just returns a floating point number. Um, and we can implement traits the same way. We can make a circle struct that has a radius. And then we can teach the circles how to find their area. And we can implement traits multiple times. We can have another square. And now we can treat these both as shapes because we've implemented the shape trait for both of them. And here's an example of how we can use them with this trait. So we have a method big enough that is generic over a type T which um, is constrained to be a shape. Um, I have an enclosure, which is a reference to a shape. Um, and if its area is more than 100, then it is big enough. Um, if we define a circle with, ra with radius 10 and a square with a side length 5, the circle is big enough and the square is not. Um, and the interesting thing about this is big enough, uh, just like the toy function, doesn't need to know anything about the about circles or squares or complex numbers. It only has to know that they are shapes and they fulfill the contract. Um, okay. We'll pause here again. Um, are there any questions? <laughs>
Um, I, I didn't cover this. The question is, uh, why is it generic over type T shape instead of just an enclosure as a reference to a shape? Um, and this is because traits are not, traits don't have a pattern in memory. Um, you can't like say this is a trait and know exactly how big it is and exactly how it looks because traits define behavior, not memory. Um, so in this case, if it's actually going to be in the compiled code, probably, uh, two versions of big enough, one for circles and one for squares. Um, this isn't always true. Sometimes there's dynamic dispatch and other things that I don't worry about. <laughs> um, yeah, th th that's why you can't just say a reference to a shape. Um, yeah, you can have a box uh, trait, a, a box trait. Can you put it behind a reference as well? Yeah, you can put it behind a reference. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, I guess sometimes you can just do reference to a shape, um, but you can't, for example, have an enclosure takes a shape by value uh, without the reference because of the memory issues. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, so one problem in other languages with um, this kind of behavior is that you might say, I want to implement the add trait for i32s and redefine behavior and that breaks everyone else. So kind of like this. I want to define add to ignore the right-hand side and double the left-hand side. This would be a very bad thing if you could actually do it in the language. So you can't. Uh, this is the kind of error message you'll get. Um, there's two different errors here. The first one is that add is already defined for i32s. Like someone's already done it, you can't have it twice. Uh, this is, um, th this just makes it so the compiler always knows what you mean, you can't be ambiguous. Um, and the second error here is, I should read my slide. The second error is that there's already one in existence. The first error is what's told a, a trait coherence problem, and that's that you do not own the trait that you're trying to implement, and you do not implement, or you, you do not own the type you're trying to implement it for. So in other words, none of these things are yours, you can't modify them. Um, the actual rules are more complex than that, but that's a pretty basic, under, that's a pretty good understanding, it'll get you 90% of the way there. Um, uh, another thing that, this does is if you have like someone like a library X and a library Y, you cannot uh, implement one of Y's traits for one of X's types because you are neither of them. You don't own those types or traits. Um, but it's okay to implement uh, a trait that you, that you don't own for a type that you do or a trait that you do own for a type that you don't. Does that make sense? Uh, so the next thing that I wanted to do, um, well, actually, I should pause here. Um, so that is most of the basics of the types and, and of types and traits. Um, it's all very generic and not very concrete yet. Um, so we're, we're going to go through some examples next. But I'll pause here again. And uh, does anyone want to go over any of that again? Does that all make sense? Um, only if you're implementing it for a type that you own. So you have to own one, not both. So if you pull in a crate, you do not own that crate's type. So 
uh, that depends on where the trait came from. If you have defined the trait, then yes. But if you pulled that trait from another crate or, an, or the standard library, no. Um, uh, if I'm remembering my history correctly, uh, the way I'm presenting it is pretty close to the original rules, and then they weren't uh, they weren't loose enough. So there was a very complicated rewrite that said, "Okay, now we think we can do everything you want safely," and it wasn't good enough. And there was another even more complicated rewrite that made the rules e even a little more tricky. And the good news is you don't have to memorize these. You just Try it, and if it doesn't work, the compiler will tell you no, stop. Um, so a, a lot of Rust is talking with the compiler and, and like having a little conversation like, can I do this? No, no, that's bad. Don't do that. That's not safe. Okay. Um, so I want to go over some types that are not the basic types, but they're defined in the standard library. These are part of the language, and they're, you'll find them just about everywhere. It's going to be option, result, vec, and hash map. And we'll go over each one of these. We'll start with option. Option is either something or nothing. Um, and that sounds really simple, but it turns out to be very useful to have. Um, in Python or JavaScript, you might have a function that returns a value or undefined or none. Um, in Java, you might have this returns something or null. Um, and this, if you aren't expecting it, is a pain. It's terrible. And if you are expecting it, it's still kind of a pain. Um, so Rust bakes us into the type system. They make you deal with it. If you want to return something or nothing, you return an option for something. Um, so here we have a method that says, I'm going to get you directions. Uh, I want a reference to a start location and a reference to an end location. And I will give you maybe a path. I might fail. There might not be any path between these two. So I might say none. And then uh, this interacts with, um, you can say like match on this. So you can say, I would like to know, in this case, if it is sum, I will do this. And if it is none, I will do this. And this is where the, the flow control that I talked about comes in. Similar to option is result. A result is either something or an error. Um, this is often used when you're dealing with IO. Um, you know, excuse me, reading files or talking to the internet. Sometimes things fail. Um, this is distinct from option in that option, none is not an error case. It just means I have no answer to give you. Uh, for result, it is something or an error. And usually errors have messages attached to them, but not always. Uh, result is generic over T the value and E the error. Um, so in like standard I.O., there's like a standard I.O. error um, that might tell you there was an OS error, I could not read the file, or you do not have permission. Um, but in other parts of Rust, there's different errors you can get. Um, I don't have any off the top of my hand. Um, the third t type I want to talk about is called VEC. Um, this you will this you'll see everywhere is basically one of the fundamental types. Um, it is a growable array. Uh, it's a dynamic array. It's a vector in many other languages. Um, and generally, if you want like an owned bit of data that is a list of data, you'll use this instead of arrays. Because arrays are a fixed size and generally more difficult to work with. 
Um, you can also, just like an array, you can take a slice of a vector, which is how you generally pass around the data inside of it. Um, um, and I'll point out that vec is similar to Python's list type or JavaScript's arrays. What's that? Right, a slice is like a, it's a fat pointer. It's not a copy. Uh, the fourth built-in type that I want to talk about is uh, the hash map. This is similar to JavaScript's object or Python's dict, um, but it's a little pickier because of the type system. So let me walk through this example. Um, we have a mapping of people to their offices, or rather, sorry, office numbers to people's names. Uh, we'll insert uh, in office 123, we have Jane Smith. In office number 196, we have Sarah Johnson. So if we try and print the, uh, we'll get something from office 196, it will say Sarah Johnson. If we try and get something from office 999, which is not defined, uh, your, your program will crash. You'll get a panic and it just won't go any further. Um, this is because the index rate doesn't return an option, it returns something, always something, or your program crashes. Uh, hash maps also have a method get, which does return an option. And if you try and get 999 from this with the method, you'll get an option, none. I, I don't have anything like this. And if you were to say get for 123, you would get a option that says sum and then Jane Smith. Um, and then finally, I'm gonna talk about some traits that are in the standard library that are very useful to deal with. Um, from and, and into are sort of a pair that work together. From string is a sort of a specialization of from, it's very useful. And it's also debug and display. So this is, an, this is implementing from. Um, from and into are the way you deal with a lot of conversions that are not trivial. So if, if it's expensive to do or any kind of manipulation of memory, usually you do it with from. There's a blanket implementation of into that says anything that implements from uh, it will define the reverse relationship for into. So here we can define from a tuple of i32s into complex numbers. And so this just takes the two values out of uh, the tuple and puts them into the complex number. And this is useful because you can take a method that is generic that wrong. You take a method that is uh, generic over some type that is into complex, and then when you call that method, you don't have to necessarily give it a complex number. You can give it anything that can change into a complex number. Uh, and here you can see how into and from work together. Because we've defined from a tuple of i32s to complex, this method works. Right, uh, that's because there's a, the, in the standard library, there's a blanket implementation that defaults um, anything that is from X, you can say into X and get it, or something into something else. Yes. Right, yeah, so that's one of the complexities in the trait, uh, the trait rules is if you are more specific, you can often implement a trait that's already implemented. Um, so if you have a super special fast way of reversing your from, you may uh, implement an into trait, but you don't have to. It just happens. Um, and that's because um, from and into have this relationship. 
and that's documented. Um, it doesn't happen for other trades unless like those trades have defined those implementations. Yeah. Um, well, it's defined in the same place as the trades. Um, Um, because I, I didn't cover this, but you can implement traits for some generic kind of type. Um, so you can implement it for many different types. Yeah. Right. Um, so what this does, um, if I had typed this correctly, this should be T, which is into complex, and then C is of type T. Um, I should take notes about this. Um, and so it, it, this is this is where it makes many copies of the function one for each uh, type we're going to do that. So. Yeah. So, so if you want a reference, it will only make one. Um, but if you take a value, it will make multiple copies. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. Uh, that's a good question. Um, from is generally much more, much easier to implement than into. Um, the trait's a little nicer. Um, but when you're taking parameters like this, you want to use into because the API is much nicer. Um, and they could have done this in one trait. They could have had like a from into trait. But then they can't do that trick where they provide a blanket implementation for one or the other. Um, so this way you can have, you only have to implement half of the, of the work and it will do the rest for you. Does that make sense? Right. Uh, yes, actually. What it does is the, the lifetime of the, of the original C ends right there, sort of. Um, or like rather, it, that, that value is no longer accessible, and we're defining a new C. Um, this is how you can apply, uh, so even though C is not mutable, you can do those, because it's a new C. I, uh, yes, actually, um, I have an example for that soon, um, sort of. It's, uh, the from string thing in particular is actually really powerful, one of my favorite things of traits. Um, so one, there's one type of from into the relationship that's really, really common, um, and that's strings. It's like going from a string to some type or from type to some string. And these are so common that there are specific traits just for this. Um, you have from sir, which um, I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't have the definition here because it's a bit bigger. Um, but this is one of my favorite snippets, and it uses from sir. So uh, let me walk you through this. Um, we have a function called read, which is generic over some type t, and we're going to constrain t, um, and it returns it uh, t. We're, get, we're going to constrain t to be from sir. That means that we can take a string and convert it into t. Um, what this method does is it will get, it'll make a buffer, which is a string and we can fill with data. It will read from standard in, uh, so just from the command line. Um, it will read data into that buffer, one line. Uh, that unwrap is because uh, reading from standard in might fail for various reasons. Um, if it does fail, this program would crash. Um, you can be uh, a little carefuler and say, oh, there was an error, I will return something else, but that doesn't fit on the slide. Um, so then we take that string and we trim it uh, to take off any white space, especially that new line on the end, and then parse it. Um, parse is something that is defined by from string. Uh, no, parse is part of the from string bit. Um, 
So it takes anything, takes a string and returns something that is from the string. And then it unwraps it because that might fail too. Um, and then down below, we call this twice. I, I would like to read an I32. I'd like to read an F32. And uh, just like you said earlier, um, it will figure out what you wanted to return based on what's happening. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, this can only deal with one value at a time. Um, and you can make a version of this that like splits on commas and then parses both sides. Um, that's, that's also a pretty useful thing that I've used in the past. Uh, this can only deal with one type per line. Uh, yes. Uh, no, because T itself has no uh, T does not define anything about parse or from string or anything like that. Um, if you never mention T, you have to mention some type, right? Okay. Right. Okay. Sorry, I wanted to fix my slides what way you guys were talking. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, hopefully this makes a little more sense. There was a uh, trim, I, trim, I didn't call it as method, and I'd renamed a buffer from S in the past. So sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I mentioned, so like from and into are um, pair, a pair. Um, and from str lets you go from strings to some object. We don't have the other side of that pair. Um, one instance of that other side uh, are the debug and display traits. Um, anytime you try and print something, you're either you're probably going to be interacting with either uh, debug or display. If you use just two curly braces, that's display, and that's meant for like pretty human output. Um, and if you use uh, quest or colon question mark, that is the debug version of the output. And this is more like internal guts of the system. Um, and this is the, the traits, very simplified version of the traits. Um, debug and display are very similar. They both have a method called format, which takes some a reference to some object, and then they give it a mutable formatter function. Um, and impl implementers of this trait are expected to you to call methods on the formatter to write things out to whatever string you're doing, dealing with. It might be a file, it might be uh, a string, it might be standard out, there's a lot of options. Uh, so if you want to implement display, for example, for our complex numbers, um, oh, let's just skip over that, I forgot to finish writing that slide. Um, but you, you call various methods on format to uh, write to that string and you write your different variables. 
Um, if you want to imp implement debug, um, you can do it for it. Uh, you can do it automatically. If you say, I would like an implementation of debug, the compiler knows how to do that. It's called derivation. Um, and for structs, as long as er all of your methods or all of your members are also implementing debug, you can automatically implement debug. And you get output kind of like this. Um, basically, every struct should probably implement debug unless for some reason it can't. And if it can't, maybe you should think about why it can't. Um, this is very useful for debugging, for error messages. Um, it just generally makes your life better. Um, implementing display is something that not everything needs to do. But if you, if you want to write stuff to a command line interface, that's, that's pretty useful. And, sorry, yes. No, no, please. Uh, no. Um, yeah. yeah, this is part of the compiler. I believe that compiler plugins, which are only available in, in Nightly, can do this, but I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. That annotation there? Um, and there are other traits, traits that you can derive. Um, I think copy and uh, move sync, I think, is one of them. Partial eek. Um, actually, and, and you can also do ord and uh, full eek. Um, so, uh, what's that? I'm not sure about size, maybe. Um, so, uh, all of these are traits that we're talking about. Um, so, for example, partial eek means uh, it's partial equality. It means you can compare two objects and say, are they equal or not? And sometimes it might say, I don't know because floating point numbers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about this earlier. The, uh, the, fl the floating point standard requires that uh, there is a value called not a number, which is not equal to itself, is not greater than itself, is not less than itself. It, it's just not anything to anything. So that's why we have partial eq. And you look at all the all the types in the standard library, the only one that doesn't implement eek, the, the full equality, is floating points. So I typically did this to us. Um, ORD is the trait that lets you compare numbers or compare things. Like, is it greater than, is it less than? Um, so for, like a sorting algorithm requires that its types be uh, ORD or partial ORD, depending on the algorithm. A lot of these built-ins you can derive. Any, any more questions? Um, that's the end of my slides. I'm happy to talk about anything we covered today. Uh, if you want to go into more depth on that.